Hello everyone, I'm Russ McLean, Chair of the Patient Voices Group, and today I've come along to the Royal Blackburn Teaching Hospital to speak to um, Mr Kevin McGee, who has the unenviable task of not only being the Chief Executive of East Lancashire Hospitals Trust, but also the Blackpool Teaching Hospitals Foundation Trust. Hello Kevin. Hi Russ, good afternoon. Now I'd like to start by asking you a few questions about your dual role. I've had a, f a few comments in, and as you can probably imagine, uh, there have been a flurry of questions about this this new dual role that you'll be doing. Uh, so I've picked a few of those uh, to, to put to you. The first one is from a patient in Pendle, and he asks, will you be receiving two salaries or just the one? I can absolutely say just the one salary. <laughs> and that's answered that question. Um, and a patient from Woolley is asking, how can you possibly give 100% commitment to either trust if you're only part-time at both? So I'm a full-time chief executive um, across uh, a number of sites. If you look up and down the country, there's many examples of chief execs working across different organisations and more sites than, than we have in, um, in Lancashire. What, what it's about, really, is making sure that you've got very good teams in all locations and that's what I'm now putting in place really strong teams of leaders of senior clinicians who can manage the organization my role is to then give strategic direction across the different sites now I know that we spoke uh, in our last blog I think the fact that um, you were only going to be at the at Blackpool Trust temporarily um, you have got this chief exec's job but how supportive have both trust boards uh, and chair people of those trusts been, been towards you with that? So it's been a, a long process looking at um, the appointment and how we support both organisations it's been through an exhaustive process with boards and both chairman and boards have been um, um, supportive of going forward with this joint appointment. And I need to be really, really clear, we're not talking about any form of organisational merges in any way, short, shape or form. I know that's been on one or two people's mind. This is one chief executive working across two separate organisations and we're, in calling, we're calling it an improvement approach because East Lancashire can learn from the good practices in Blackpool and Blackpool can share and learn from the good practices in East Lancashire. And it's easier to do that having one chief executive but two separate organisations. Yeah, you, you sort of answered my next question, which was about um, the trusts amalgamating. So a lot of people are quite concerned that this might happen. I, I, is it going to happen? No, absolutely not. It's simply not on the agenda. This is simply about how we share leadership across organisations in Lancashire. What's absolutely clear going forward is that the provider, the acute organisations in Lancashire need to work differently together. We don't have the workforce and we don't have the um, manpower, the staffing to be um, and to work as we've always done. So we need to share expertise, we need to share good practice and in some instances we need to share staff where it's appropriate. But that's what it's about. It's not about organisational mergers. If we start going down that line, we're going to spend a lot of time, a lot of energy and a lot of money. Whereas what we should be talking about is how do we improve outcomes? How do we improve services for the population of Lancashire and South Cumbria? And we do that by getting the organisations to work together to support one another, to share staff. You know, the, these hospitals, the Royal Blackman Hospital and the uh, Blackpool Hospital, they are sort of very similar in, the, in that they have a large number of patients. Do they have similar problems? I think all large acute hospitals have similar problems. We have a lot of patients, we have increasing um, acuity, so the poorliness of the patients that are coming in, we have workforce problems and shortages of workforce, and there is a continual need to do more work with the money that we've got. So I would say not just in Lancashire, but every acute hospital in the country has similar issues. So I've had a, a letter in from a lady who wonders if you could explain to her in layman's terms exactly what the difference is because uh, the Royal Blackburn, the East Lancashire Hospitals Trust, uh, is not a foundation trust whereas the Blackpool Trust is a foundation trust. So what, what exactly is that difference? When foundation trusts were first set up, they did have some more financial freedom so they could gain and they could get access to capital to improve services, to improve buildings, and they had more access to capital that, that say, a, a, a hospital trust didn't. Um, foundation trusts also have governors that make them accountable to the local population in a more 
direct way. But I have to say, over the years, the 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 if like the access to capital for foundation trusts has been more and more and more restricted. So from a financial perspective, there's very little difference now between uh, a foundation trust and a non-foundation trust. Staffing is obviously an issue at both trusts, and in fact across the UK, because everyone, I, I guess, is fishing from the same pool. How do you address those issues about staffing and, and encouraging staff to become involved in the NHS, both here in East Lancashire and, and in Lancashire wider afield? So that's very much about the reputation of the organisations and uh, we want to attract the best and the brightest that work in healthcare in Lancashire and South Cumbria and so the reputations of the organisations are really important and we've spent a lot of time over the last five years in East Lancashire really improving our reputation. We've got a great reputation now as a good place to work, uh, providing high quality care and so staff want to work here and we've done really well attracting staff. And of course, you know, it has, uh, hasn't has gone without notice that this trust, East Lancashire Hospitals Trust, has gone from a trust being in special measures to a trust that's now rated as good by the CQC. Is that something you're hoping to replicate in Blackpool? I think both organisations have to have the aspiration going forward to be outstanding. If you look at um, the staff that we've got, if you look at the brilliant services that we can run, if you look at our buildings, we should be good to outstanding in all our areas of, 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 of delivery. And that's something that together, supporting one another, is an absolute aspiration to achieve. Of course, Kevin, it's come to my attention and the Patient Voices Group attention that Professor Riley uh, is leaving. So we'd like to wish him the best of luck. But I'm a little bit worried, given the fact that there don't seem to be the right calibre of personal people out there. Do we need to be worrying about filling uh, Professor Riley's position as board member of the board and medical director? Uh, no, absolutely not. So um, Damien is going into a role staying within the organisation and he's going to lead for clinical strategy. And um, because going back to the previous conversation that we've just had, our reputation is good. And as a consequence, we've got some outstanding um, candidates for the medical director's post. So we're interviewing at the back end of October and I'm absolutely certain we will make a first class appointment. We'll do wishing well from us. Um, I'd like to ask, and I get asked this a lot by patients, how much, if any, has the Brexit crisis impacted on your ability to either keep or retain staff or, or in fact, recruit staff? For us in East Lancashire, it's not had a massive impact. I think if you were a hospital, say, in London or one of the major sort of cities in the south of the country, um, you know, you would be worried because a large number of your staff may be um, European staff. That's not the case for us in in, in terms of you know big numbers. Um, so it's something we're looking at. It's something that we're planning for. We're really conscious that we need or we need the right materials and food and drugs and dressings. But um, we think our planning is appropriate, and we are as confident as we can be that we will get through this next. We will get through the next few weeks and months. With reference to something you mentioned there, drugs, are you having any difficulties in obtaining those drugs? We've had no difficulties up to this point. So I'd like to turn now to um, four patients who've contacted me over the last month expressing their concerns at the length of time it's taking for them to be given an appointment for their scans. So the question is, are you having problems with the department, with staffing or with the equipment? Some of these patients have been given an appointment for scans six months into the future. So there's been a lot of pressure in terms of diagnostic services, um, particularly on scans, so CT scans, MRI scans. We are looking to source additional capacity, but the, the requirements and the need for scanning has gone up significantly over the last 18 months. Um, we've had some good news in terms of capital um, potentially being given to the organisation to improve our scanning facilities and we're hopeful that when we get that in place, it will help to reduce any backlogs. But it is a service that has been under pressure over the last few months. And I think um, from some of the reading that I've done recently, it, it's not a problem that's dedicated to East Lancashire. It's, it's actually a national problem. It's very much a national problem. If you think about, you know, there's been some really big national publicity campaigns around likes of bow, you know, bowel screening and, 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 and other areas of screening. And this is absolutely right, but what it's done has increased the number of people who wish to have scans undertaken and of course um, that's put more pressure on the departments. 
So since we last spoke, the Trust has announced a new campaign to tackle the rising number of verbal or physical assaults against your staff. We touched upon this a few months ago, I don't know whether you remember, but you have a campaign, it's called Your Safety Matters, and hopefully that will push home the message that it is completely unacceptable to either verbally or physically assault your staff. But I suppose the question for me is, how or what sanctions can you place upon people who do think that it's perfectly okay to do that? So our staff are doing brilliant jobs in really difficult circumstances day in, day out. The very last thing that they should um, experience is any form of physical or verbal abuse from from patients or their families. It's just simply unacceptable. I mean, ultimately, I can exclude patients from these hospitals and these services. Is that something you'd do? And that's something I would absolutely do if I thought it was appropriate. So if we have um, people who consistently and persistently abuse members of staff, I will exclude them from our services. I think that's good to hear. Um, I would like to stay with staffing, if I could, and particularly flu jabs. And I know that every year you hope to get better and better. Is that something you're trying to push this year, to get everybody on board, to get the staff on board with flu jabs, to protect not only themselves and their families, but also patients, of course? Yes, of course. And over the last few years, we've been in the top... um, two trusts every year in terms of the number of staff who have the flu jab. Um, We're looking to improve on this this year and we're looking to get 95% of all our staff vaccinated, which hopefully again will make us one of the very, very top performing trusts in the country. So, you know, I, I would encourage every member of staff to have their flu jab to protect both themselves, their families and our patients. Now, of course, I, I couldn't go w- w- through one of our chats without mentioning A&E, and it's come to my attention, and a number of, of, of press have reported on the fact that a lot of patients are still attending A&E. I hate to use the word unnecessarily because these people are, are ill and, and seeking help, but they're coming with uh, minor illnesses, and, and they shouldn't be attending A&E. The clue's in the name. It's accident and emergency, not anything and everything. What, what would you say, what message would you give to those people to try and dissuade them from, from coming to A&E? So A&E is a very precious resource, and um, people who need A&E departments and services um, need to be treated in as quick a time as possible. So if you do not need an A&E department, if you do not need those services, there are other alternatives. There are urgent care centres, there are walking centres, you know, there is 111 service, there are pharmacists, there are your GPs. Please, please, please think about going elsewhere and using these services responsible. Um, clearly, if people need A&E services, we need to be here. But if you do need an A&E service, you need to be seen as quickly as possible and therefore any inappropriate attendances is a misuse of those services. So at the beginning of the year, I spoke to you about mental health patients, um, in particular those that were presenting themselves at your accident and emergency department. Could I ask if that situation has improved? So we still get uh, um, a number of patients um, presenting in A&E with both physical and mental health um, concerns. We work very, very closely with our partners in Lancashire Care Foundation Trust um, to look after those patients and give them both the physical care and the and the, the mental health care that they require. Um, but it is fair to say this is a, an area that has been significant pressure in Lancashire. Um, I'm really happy to say that working with Lancashire Care Foundation Trusts, I think things are improving, the pathways are improving, but it is something we have to deal with day in, day out. And I think it's important for me as chair of the Patient Voices Group to remind patients that you actually don't provide mental health services. You're an acute trust. The service provision is from Lancashire Care Foundation Trust in, in, in the Lancashire area. That, that, that's right. But clearly, um, through A&E, you know, a number of patients will present both with physical and mental health. And what we need to do is work with our partners to look after the needs of those patients who are presenting um, and I think the situation is improving. We are working, as I said, very closely with, with colleagues in the Mental Health Trust, um, and we look to give the best experience and the best care possible. I'd like to stick with A&E because your targets have been uh, improving over the last, certainly over the last 12 months, the figures have gone up uh, by a number of percentage points. It, does that give you joy? Joy perhaps isn't the right word, but does that give, you know, are, are you encouraged by those figures? 
So the first thing I do virtually every morning, um, seven days a week, and the last thing I do every evening, seven days a week, is look at how our A&E department is looking and look at the figures and look at the number of patients that may be in there. So it's something that's very high on my my agenda and, and on my priorities. We have seen some 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 improvement, but we need to see more improvement. But it's fair to say that you know we are going into a winter period. In, in October, the first few weeks in October, we have seen an increase in patients looking to access these services, and demand has been high. So I am nervous about winter. We're doing all we can in terms of planning and um, putting appropriate measures in place. But it really goes back to what you were saying before us. You know what patients can do to help us and to help themselves is to only attend A and E if it's absolutely necessary. Some good news. Uh, let's talk stroke services. Uh, we're told that for the fourth quarter of 12 months, East Lancashire Hospitals Trust has been rated A in the st- stroke audit. Can you explain what, what that is? So the stroke audit, uh, uh, anybody who presents into the hospital with cert- symptoms of a potential stroke should have certain um, interventions in a, peri- in, in a set period of time. And um, the more of those interventions you can give a person in a, per- a short period of time, the better will be their outcomes, potential outcomes. And um, going back a number of years, we used to be quite perform quite poorly in this area. It used to be measured, and there's a, a scale from from A to E, and we were quite low down that. Um, over the last 12 months or so, we've consistently been rated A in this in this area, which is a great great um, indication of the services that we provide in East Lancashire for stroke patients, and it's something I'm absolutely delighted with. Um, a patient writes that she's impressed with all the uh, developments that, that East Lancashire Hospitals Trust are undertaking, but she tells me that she's worried that you're not going to have the staff to, to work in those units. Well, you know, as we've already discussed, staffing is my biggest headache and, and it's something that we need to continue pushing with. I think given the reputation of East Lancs and how well we're seen to be performing, we are attractive to staff and we are attracting some absolutely brilliant staff to work with us but it becomes a continual pressure and it's something that we have to work at day in, day out. Talking of new units, the Trust has uh, announced the opening of a new emergency surgical unit in January 2020. Can you explain how this will work and how it will improve um, life for patients? So um, it, this is a, um, a 16 to £18 million pound new investment. One of the biggest problems that we face with on the emergency pathway is just that the hospital has just been too small for the number of patients that we need to access going through um, our services. So this will give us more work, it will allow us to remodel the whole of the emergency pathway, not just patients coming into A&E, but when they need to go into um, ambulatory care or where they need to go into surgical emergencies or medical emergencies, and it will give us much more physical capacity in state-of-the-art facilities. So, Kevin, we've come to that, that time of the month um, where I ask you, what are your reasons to be cheerful? So, Kevin McGee, what are your reasons this month to be cheerful? Well, we employ over 8,000 staff in East Lancashire, and every one of those members of staff are my reasons to be cheerful. I see day in, day out, the most wonderful services delivered. Great news. Kevin McGee, Chief Executive of East Lancashire Hospitals Trust and, of course, the Blackpool Teaching Foundation Trust, thank you for your time uh, and thank your staff for their care. Thank you. I'd like to end this month uh, by reminding everyone that A&E is for accidents and emergencies. Uh, Please help our NHS this winter by using services appropriately. If in doubt, ring 111, which is free from mobiles and landlines. Until next time, keep warm and keep well. Thank you.